I hope all is well with you today. I walk down the street, uh, not as often as I should, but try to do about three miles a day. And sometimes maybe I'm a little discouraged or depressed about something that's probably silly. And then I look around and I see a blue sky, sittle breeze, that didn't make the fishermen happy, but a nice breeze in the palms. Maybe I think about her playing the piano or her leading the music or you being here, and I think, life is so good. What's the matter with you? I tell the grandkids, don't play with the phone when you cross the water. Look at the water. Isn't it beautiful? We have so much to be thankful for. I'm thankful that you're here this morning. Let me read this passage in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 4. This is, this is a stewardship message that's a little bit overdue. This is something that we do. It is, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 4.2. It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So anyway, this is the time of year when pastors and churches focus on stewardship. And like, as I said, I'm a little bit late here because so many other things have sort of taken the place of uh, what I really wanted to do. And now next Sunday, of course, we begin, uh, and some of you have already begun to think about well, Palm Sunday, uh, Easter, and, and uh, continue to pray and fast, whatever you do, uh, or maybe it's something you need to, to begin to do uh, as we approach Easter. And be sure that you pick up a brochure that tells you what we're doing. We will be having, uh, ultimately, the uh, sunrise service at Chica again this year. Let me begin with two questions. What is a steward? Hey, this is really uh, 101. You've heard it before. I, I, I don't do much different. I go through this huge pile of stewardship, and I think there's just certain things I want to say. I guess I'm going to say it again this year, but, uh, so you've heard some of it. A steward is a person who manages the property and affairs of someone else. Not really about tithing. You know, we think stewardship's about tithing. Not at all, really. Although, I'll be glad to bring that in at the end, Okay. Uh, in the context of the Christian community, accepting God is the first step in becoming a steward. The qu second question, whose property and affairs am I to manage? Well, duh, I become the manager for the one who possesses all the silver and all the gold, the real estate, all the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says, and that doesn't begin to describe his holdings. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas, established it upon the waters. Psalm 50.10, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountain and, and the creatures of the field are mine. Uh, 12b, the world is mine and all that is in it. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. So the Lord's possessions include everything. We don't always think that way, do we? Somehow we think it's ours. Well, I earned it. I went to school to, to have my job to do this. It all belongs to the Lord, whatever he's blessed you with. Psalms 8, 4 through 6, What is man that you are mindful of him? You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. So we're stewards. We are rulers, according to the Bible, according to his word. It's warm up here this morning. So number one, as stewards of God, we are the overseers of his creation, the world and its contents. Genesis 126 says, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So even after the curse, God didn't withdraw this responsibility from us. We are responsible to care for the world that God has given us. Although scripture in general will agree with most, with a lot of ecology groups, that man is responsible for his environment, we may disagree with them on how it should be maintained. For instance, many in the ecology movement say that mankind is in danger. They point to issues like the ozone depletion and global warming to support their claims, which are highly questionable. The Bible is clear that the existence of the human race is not in jeopardy, that God is in control of all of our destiny, and he has planned the future for mankind. The Bible is very specific that any major adjustment in the ecology of the earth is God working and not related to the fine-tuning 
of the environment by mankind. Don't get upset yet. I'm not finished, okay? Another reason some people are supportive of ecology issues, and you'll find this everywhere, uh, they seem to view ecology as a sort of form of God. Uh, New Age religion emphasizes ecology, oneness with nature, even though they don't acknowledge that there's a higher power. So having said that, God does want us to respect and protect his creation. I'll give you an example in a moment. I have a very close friend that I used to, used to work with. It used to work directly for uh, uh, a fellow named Al Gore, I think, when he was in the White House and also uh, maybe before and after. And In fact, I think he's been here to church, but I'm not sure. He's certainly been in our home uh, since we've been here. Al is one of those fellows that affixes on the extreme. He once claimed that global warming was boiling the ocean. Fourteen years ago at Copenhagen Climate Conference, he said there was a 75% chance that the North Pole uh, ice cap could be completely ice-free in seven years, but that was 14 years ago. And in 2006, in a documentary entitled An Inconvenient Truth, he predicted the global sea level could rise 20 feet in the near future. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, at the rate it's rising, it would take 1,136 years to rise 20 feet. Now, I saw something in Bible study this morning where it talked about Cape Hatteras, that, the, that, that the, uh, it had risen until they moved the lighthouse. So that's happening, but that had a lot to, more to do with the wind and the rain and the storm and the movement of the sand. Al and company are quite creative as they present, you know, their agenda. But yet God wants us to rule wisely, absolutely does, uh, to be good stewards, to understand that he is God. Jesus testifies to nature and beauty in Matthew 6, 28, where it says, Consider the lilies, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. We're blessed and we're inspired and we're ministered to by the environment through our senses. How about sight? Just what I was talking about. The stars, the ocean. My kids come back from Alaska talking about seeing the northern lights. I even saw, I even saw the northern lights when I was a child one time in Indiana. I don't know how I got up there. I don't know what it's doing out of Alaska and up the north, but I did. I actually saw that. Amazing. Uh, the trees, the flowers, the mountains, the hills, all that. I love it. I love it. I sometimes go outside at night, to maybe to take out the trash or something, and it's so beautiful and everything's perfect. I think, why am I sitting in the house? What am I doing in here? And then I go back in the house and sit. But uh, taste, um, fresh fruit, Kentucky Wonder, green beans, Georgia peaches, pecans, yellowtail fish, all of that is from God. He's blessed us through the environment and our senses. Uh, the sense of touch. A hug from a friend, a pat on the back, maybe a puppy nuzzling a little boy or a little girl or a kitten making its way through a nursing home to some of those folks there. The smell of honeysuckle, gardenia, jasmine, fresh cut hay. You don't get the smell of much fresh cut grass and when you do here you want to stop and go, hmm, I remember that. Got a lot of fresh cut uh, gravel. Inspiration by way of God's handiwork, through our senses. God's plan that we be rulers and that we be stewards of everything he created, but not extremist, but rather responsible. And I'll give you an example, and, I, and some of you heard me share this. 1958, Mayo Zedong, the, um, the member of the Evil Club, he initiated a hygiene campaign against four pests. Any of you read about the four pests uh, campaign. It was initiated against mosquitoes. I could live with that. Flies, rats, and sparrows. And in response, millions of Chinese took to the street. They banged on the walks. Whatever they did to terrify the birds, and the idea was to force them to stay in the air until they dropped dead of exhaustion. Whatever their method, they accomplished their task. Sparrow population was, went nearly extinct, and it would be safe to say that Mayo didn't care, he didn't understand that when God created the sparrow, the Bible says he saw that it was good. And since he didn't believe in God, and he didn't understand anything about God, and he didn't care that God created everything for a purpose, 
He did accomplish his goal. He ridded the land of the sparrows. The campaign was a total success, which means it was a disaster. And one of the results was the sparrow was plate replaced by caterpillars, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. They blanketed the land. They covered the trees. The sparrows normally fed on the caterpillars, but when the, the predators are gone, it creates an ecological imbalance, and the caterpillars became a plague of biblical proportion. It exacerbated the great Chinese famine, where 20 million people starved to death. Not that he would care very much. There's a balance of nature that God set in motion. We are the guardians, stewards of the environment. Because of greed and selfishness, we have respect, disrespected God's creation, I suppose as much as we've disrespected God himself. So that's number one. Number two, as stewards, we are to be kingdom catalysts. What do you mean, pastor? Well, as Christ's followers, we're to give of ourselves. You hear that from me all the time. We're to be the light that God calls us to be. We're to make a difference. As the Bible says, we're to be salt and light. Ultimately, or we are to be holy vessels that practice the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person, everything. Love people, help people, witness to people, be there for people. It's not about me. I said that because holiness does make us, and we've talked a little bit about it, but probably not enough. Holiness does make us honest about our sin. If you're holy, you are honest about your sin. Uh, you don't say, well, I don't commit sin. I never did. You don't, you don't go in that direction. It also inspires us to seek and save those who are lost. In each gospel, the calling of Matthew is surrounded by narratives that involve the Pharisees. This is important because the Pharisees are really there to show contrast. Do you ever think about that? Why else would God insist that gospel writers give so much space to such a small religious sect? I mean, like there were only 6,000 maybe in all of that, in all the land. I mean, it could be that God wants us to notice the humility and the courage of sinners like Matthew compared to the arrogance of the saints, which were the Pharisees at the time. The sinners were the only honest people. Well, my, my stepdad would say there were some really good Pharisees, but the Bible doesn't indicate that there were a lot of really good Pharisees. In this sense, the first desire of Jesus was not that the world convert, but for the people to be honest with themselves first. That's really what you have to do. We can't confront people and talk them out of evil. It doesn't work. We can confront them with the gospel and urge them to be honest within themselves and to think. Those outside the church have heard of, you know, about the things that people in the church might expect of them, and they infer that they are not yet good enough to come to church. Well, I can't be that good. How many of you know people in the church that are perfect? Mm. Okay, I didn't think so. Or they can't live the Christian life because it's just too hard, because that's what they, in the church, oh, everybody's perfect. They don't use that word, but they don't understand that Jesus is attracted to sinners, absolutely attracted to sinners. They think, he, God, might ask me to clean up my life without making me want to. Oh, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. But there's another more subjective side to holiness, and that comes from Matthew. True holiness is the capacity to celebrate the victory of forgiveness while re repenting of its dreadful cost to Jesus Christ, to be able to see that. Holiness brings the power not to sin, okay? Okay. But more than that, it allows the freedom to admit when we do sin. Because none of you, as much as, we, as much as I like to think about the fact that we don't have to sin, we don't have to sin daily in thought, word, and deed. I've heard that before. We don't have to, depending on your de definition of sin. But we do. And if you don't, let's go to lunch after church. I want to hear all about it. That you, the ones that don't sin, that never did. Okay? You haven't. Okay. More than being well... Holiness means, also means getting better. It means growing in Christ. Holiness is a, is a brokenness over the toll that sin has taken upon the world, and yet a reminder that we also contributed to that evil. As Christians, we have a responsibility to touch lives, each in our own unique way. We're never going to, I mean, I've heard people like John Waxwell, who I know, and, and I've talked to him, and, and we spent a little time together at Indian Springs, and but he'll tell you how you go to lead someone to Christ, but 
It don't work for everyone. He may know how to do that, or God may have given him a certain gift and other, other uh, evangelists and other teachers and preachers. In 1871, you know this story. If you don't, you didn't. You didn't uh, I don't know. They don't teach history now, I know, but they used to. In 1871, Sir Henry Morgan Stanley was sent to the, to the, by the New York Herald to go to Africa to, to find Dr. David Livingston. And it was November when he finally located doc, the doctor, and supposedly, you know, he said, Dr. Livingston, I presume. We don't really know if that's legendary or not, but the word perhaps, maybe it was a play on humor since there was only one white man within thousands and thousands of acres or miles, really. And Stanley said, I went to Africa as, as, as a doubter. I was prejudiced. He said, in fact, I was as big an atheist as there ever was in London. But then I observed, I watched, I reflected on this life. And Stanley could see that Livingston lived the biblical principle. In other words, he possessed what he professed. And Stanley said Livingston's compassion and his love for others was contagious. Stanley said, I was converted by him. He never once asked me to. He never once tried to encourage me to. He didn't ever witness to me or testify. I just looked at his life, and I knew that's what I wanted. The Great Commission says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. Sometimes preaching with our lives is more important than preaching with our lips, especially if our lives don't match our lips. <laughs> How's my time? Oh, I got plenty. Okay. <laughs> Several years ago, Bishop Hughes was addressing a group of people. He shared a story about a particular deacon in a congregational church in Boston. The deacon said to himself, I, I can't do anything. Some of you say that, and it isn't true. But you say, well, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't do anything. Okay. The deacon said to himself, though, I can't, you know, I can't do these things, but I could put two extra plates on my dinner table every Sunday and invite two young men who are away from home, maybe it was an army base or a, a college setting, to break bread with me. And he did that for more than 30 years. And when he died, among those who came to pay their respects were 150 of those men who had been young men when they went through that church and through that community whose lives had been influenced for God at the dinner table. If you do it unto the least of me, these, you do it unto me. And I can, I can actually say that that happened to me and my friend when we were in basic training. Even in, even in AIT, um, somebody would come and take us to church, maybe take us to dinner. Well, after you're there a while, maybe it wouldn't mean so much, but when you're new in a community and you don't know anyone like Eli and, uh, or don't know very many people, it's really nice to have people to say, hey, let me take you here and let me do this. This is, this is a part of God's plan for Christians to reach out to one another, and uh, that's what they did for me, and I, I won't forget it. And we do that. We preach in ways other than speaking through uh, the food bank and nursing home ministry and children's ministry and uh, their clients and their staff and their families and so forth. In the parable of the talents, William Barclay suggests that Jesus is speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees when he talks about the useless servant. The religious leaders know well the law, they know the liturgy. They know everything that there's. They they know everything that, I, I guess they're supposed to know. Uh, ritual mechanics of religion. They worship with their heads, but not with their hearts, with their lips, but not with their lives. There's two sides to the Christianity coin. One side is receiving, and the other is giving, and we need to learn to do that well. Sometimes people offer you something and you say, oh, no, take it. They're offering, on, they're offering it because they love you. Uh, I've taken some things uh, I didn't really want. <laughs> but I didn't want to hurt that person, you know. You give me a pie that I don't like, I'll give it to somebody that likes it, but I won't turn it down. I like pie, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. Uh, First Peter each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So we're called to be kingdom catalyst. Number three, as a steward, I'm responsible to support the kingdom of God to, on earth financially. You knew I'd get to that, didn't you? At one time or another, we deal with financial challenge. There's a few of you here that probably have never had a financial challenge 
Maybe, maybe you had old money, but most of you have had the challenge of some kind over the years. Okay? Preaching on the subject of stewardship, by the way, financial stewardship has absolutely little or nothing to do with the level of funds in the treasury of the church. If we had a million dollars in the fund, I wish we did, actually, um, I would still preach the same message. Uh, because tithing is biblical. It honors the scriptural principle of generosity. Uh, it, it supports the church. It gives to those who are in need. It lays up treasures in heaven. It sends money to missions. I'll talk more about that another time about missions. Uh, Tithing is a principle that I think is so important to my walk with God that when I, I had, I, I, we started a pioneer church, a brand new church one time, and I had a lot of people that, from the place where I worked and some people that were sort of part-time church people, so they didn't know a lot about tithing. And I finally told them, I got a little frustrated, and I finally said, look, you won't like this, but look, if you think that, you know, there's, there's something, you know, as far as, uh, maybe somehow something personal, personal motive, uh, some kind of motive to fatten the church treasury for no particular reason, then give it to another church. Now, of course, I don't want them to do that, really. But the idea was, it's not, it's not about what we want or what we think we need. It's about being faithful to God in one of the areas and one of the principles of being a Christian. When we give, we're blessed. That sounds like a, something a good preacher would say, and you're supposed to go, wow. But it's true. When we give, we're blessed. The church is blessed. People are blessed. We benefit by giving back to God what's already his. The words of David regarding the generous offering given to the temple. David's very humble. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given only what comes from your hand. It's kind of like giving your children money to buy you a present. You've heard me tell that little story about Camden at Christmas. And Grandma said, Camden, he's five years old. Camden wants to buy you a Christmas present, Grandpa. And I, okay. Then she comes to me again because I didn't move fast enough. Grandpa, Camden wants to buy you a Christmas present. So after about the fourth time, I said, hey, Camden, uh, here you want to buy a Christmas present. Yeah, Papa, I want to buy you a Christmas present. All right. So we got in the car, and we went. And uh, when we got there and found the store to go to, I said, now, what do you want to buy? I don't know. And how much do you have to buy? Nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't have any money. So I decided that he wanted me to have a pair of needle-nose pliers, I guess something I thought I needed. Whatever we do for God comes from the hand of God. It comes from the hand of God. Let me share some reasons for giving. God's Word recognizes the role that money plays in our lives. Uh, 16 of the 38 parables, about half of them, touch on money or possessions. There are approximately 500 verses on, on prayer and 500 verses on faith, and nearly 2,000 that are money-related. God's Word has a lot to say about how to make it, how to spend it, how to save it, how to use it, how not to abuse it, and what happens when you love it. When we tithe, we show gratitude for all that God has given us, and we return to him a portion of what we have received. It's a command. It's a test for me. It's also a test for God. So, well, how to test God? It's the only place you're going to find in the Bible that I, I think, Rob may tell me at Bible study I was wrong, or maybe Lanny, but it's the only place I think where God says, test me, test me. When we tithe, we show gratitude for all that God has given us and return to him that portion. So, secondly, tithing is God's plan for sustaining his ministry. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there will be food in my house. Tithe uh, finance the, the, the maintenance of the temple, uh, fed and clothed the priest. It pays for the maintenance, the upkeep, the staff, the utilities, the improvements, the charitable uh, endeavors, outreach, fellowship, insurance. I really, am, I will tell you, I'm really amazed at what it cost to keep the doors open at this church. First of all, this is a showplace. You've kept this place immaculate, and you continue with the windows and the carpet and everything. I, I had the, the people from Net, Netflix ask me one time when they were here, they said, do people actually go to church here? Oh, yeah, we do. Like it was a 
just a, a museum piece. So it is, it, is an, it is expensive, and it's very much worth it. My friend and colleague, G.R. Bateman, used to pose this question. Very simple, but if everyone in this church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? And then just think about the time you give, the finances you give, and on and on and on. Number three, tithes and offerings are a remarkable investment. With principles suggested by Chuck Milhuff, who you probably don't know, or, or Nance, an industry consultant who we discovered, Marsha and I really developed our philosophy a long time of, of giving. And it's very simple. It really goes back to Scripture. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's a natural law. If you plant tomatoes, what do you get? Okay. What about beans? If you sow beans, what do you get? Uh-huh. What about corn? What about peas? If you sow money, what do you get? You got to go, Urgh. Well, I believe if you sow money, you either get money or something of quality that's equal. Maybe you get a better deal on a piece of real estate two years later. Maybe you, I've looked back so many times and thought, wow, God's hand was in all of that and I didn't see it. Because it wasn't easy for me to start tithing. I remember when I was young, I decided I was, I was going to tithe. But I didn't have the money. And so I just wrote checks and put them in the drawer. And someday I'll be able to cover these. I'll take them out of the drawer. <laughs> and uh, that, that was what I did. But it's a natural law. Malachi 3, 10, 11 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. There it says, Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will, have, you, will not, you, will, you will not have room enough for it. Well, preacher, you know, that's, that's talking about spiritual blessing. Well, it is that too. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. Well, preacher, that's just a, a proof text, you know? You can always find something in the Bible to, you know, to prove what, you know, that's always, you can find it. But I don't know. Let's go to Proverbs 11.25. A generous man will prosper. He will refresh others. He who refreshes others will refresh, will himself be refreshed. Oh, yeah, pastor, but that's in the Old Testament. Okay. How about Dr. Luke? That's New Testament. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Isn't that what, Pat, isn't that what the quote old saints used to say, you cannot outgive the Lord? They had already figured that out. My friend M.J. Wood told me one time, M.J., he was an incredible guy in ministry, but before that he was the he was the, the sales manager for Bluebird Bus Company, which was and maybe is the, the largest bus company in the world. Maybe it still is. I don't know. He said, I have tried my best to sacrifice to God, to do something that he wouldn't give me back. He loved God passionately. He started churches and camps and all kinds of things. At radio, on the radio, I have never been able to sacrifice to my Lord. Anything I've ever done has always come back to me. It was almost like he was sad. He couldn't do something for God that God wouldn't just, just say thank you. But no, God always blesses back to us. And then people say, I can't afford to tithe. Well, I don't want to tell you except just begin to give something and ask God to help you to grow that giving uh, and, and be, you know, be, be sincere about it. You say, I can't afford it. Well, of course, you can't afford it. You, may, you know, might have maybe spent uh, $75 for dinner two or three times a month and this and that, but... By the time we get to the end of the month, that's one reason maybe why it says give of your first fruits. 1 Corinthians 9, 6, through 7, 6 and 7, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the other way to give. And I can't say I was always a cheerful giver, but I give as much as I can and I love it. I love it that I can do it. God loves a generous, cheerful giver. Now, I know that this sounds like a prosperity preacher. 
But if it is, I only do it once or twice a year. I don't preach it every Sunday like the prosperity preachers do. But I do believe what I'm telling you to be true. And I think, I, I don't know if I can prove it to you, but my family down here can tell you, my daughter, my, my wife, my son were here. They can tell you yeah, that's what dad did. And God has blessed us over and over again. Now, some of you may have enough money that you don't worry too much about being blessed, but he may bless you in other ways. He will, in fact. So, just be open to the voice of the Lord. It's a still small, sometimes it's a still small voice. When you give with that attitude, you're planting for a personal harvest, you're opening a door. Good stewardship really is an amazing journey. And I just say, just let God guide your giving. Just be honest, as we were talking about honesty, and say, show me, show me what I should do. Tell me what I should give. So, so. In regards to money, John Wesley gave excellent advice. Make all you can. Save all you can. And give all you can. That's a wonderful way to live, isn't it? Let me close with this story. I know some of you have heard it. Because after being here almost 11 years, you had to have heard it. But, you know, it'll wake you up, okay? This well-worn dollar bill, wrinkled, faded, and there's a $100 bill. There's a $1 bill and a $100 bill. They arrive at the Federal Reserve Bank to be retired. And as they move along the conveyor belt to be burned, they strike up a conversation. The $100 bill reminisces. He said, you know, I had a good life. I've been to Atlantic City, been to Vegas, been to the Keys, I have been to the finest restaurants in the world. I've been to, to New York and New Orleans. I've been on cruises. I've been to Paris. And wow, the $1 bill said, fantastic. Wow, you have had an incredible life. Yeah, so tell me, said the, dollar, the, the $100 bill, tell me about your travels. Well, I've been to the Baptist Church and the Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, down to the United Methodist Church. The $100 bill said, What's a church? All right. God calls us to be good stewards, environmentally, spiritually, financially. C.S. Lewis said it like this because he was one of them. He was a diehard that didn't want to give his life to God. He didn't want to say, I'm all yours. See, but he said, and he was an atheist, powerful atheist, and he reluctantly came to Christ. And I quote this from Mere Christianity. That terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. Let me read it again. The terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But that's what God calls us to do. Amen? Could I hear an I don't usually do that. Could I hear an amen? It's probably not a good Sunday to ask. Father, thank you for our time together and for your many blessings. Let's stand together. We who are gathered here are the body of Jesus Christ in this world. So go in the hope, love, and the immeasurably great power of our Lord. We have a commission.